gracious Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you for the shedding of the blood yes. that washes us whiter than snow, yes. that allows us the access to come to your throne of mercy and grace. We say thank you, Lord. Then 50 days later, you gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And today we come to commemorate Pentecost, yes, the birth of the New Testament church. We thank you for that. Yes, God, thank you. Allow this word to go forth and do what it do to help your people today. And let it not come back forward. And in everything I say and in everything I do, I take none of your honor. I take none of your glory. I take none of your praise. But I'll point everyone back to you. So even now as I decrease, increase inside of me. Thank you for this preaching opportunity. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give God a praise right there? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We thank God for our worship and praise team. Amen. Our musicians. One other announcement to chew and chat. I thought I had a chat and chew. I had it right in my head. Chat and chew will be the second. Will be June the second. June the second, which is the first Saturday in June at two o'clock. I believe it's at two o'clock. So please govern yourselves accordingly. They had a grand occasion last time. Come and be a part of what God is doing here at LLWC. Amen. <laughs> We're celebrating Pentecost. We're celebrating Pentecost. It's more than just dressing up in white and having something to eat after service. Pentecost is more than that. So let's jump right into the word. Go with me to the gospel according to Acts. The gospel according to Acts. The first chapter, I want to read verses 5 and 4, and then drop down to verse 8. Acts 1, 4, 5, and 8. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. If you have your parallel Bible like I teach you to have, then you'll be able to read with me. Acts 4, and while being in their company and eating with them, this is Jesus, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, of which he said, you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but not many days from now, ye shall be baptized with, placed in or introduced to the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, but ye shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in, Jer in Jer Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, the very bounds of the earth. Amen. For just a few moments, can I talk from this subject? Send the power, Lord. Send the power, Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It's good to come to Wednesday night Bible study because you never know when I'm going to connect Wednesday with Sunday. And we're right now in the midst of studying about the Holy Spirit. I just got through doing the uh, what the Holy Spirit does on Wednesday night because it was in the gospel according to St. John that Jesus made the promise or first gave us the indication that something was coming behind him. Before that, we just knew Jesus. We didn't know there was anything greater than Jesus. 
But as he was getting to the last days of his life, and if you read that from the Gospel according to St. John from chapter 14 to the end of the book, he begins to wind down his ministry. He's been in ministry for three years. He started ministry when he was 30. He only did a three-year trip. And then he was crucified. His purpose was only three years to do ministry. But at the, about the end of his life, before the crucifixion, he began to tell the disciples that there is a promise that's not coming from me, that is already from the Father, that is coming unto you, because I got to go because the promise has to come. The promise is the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I believe, had to take 40 days because, see, he was only seen 40 days. On the 40th day, he went back to heaven. Ten days they spent waiting on the promise. For 40 days, he had to let them know why is the Holy Spirit more important than me because all they knew for three years is Jesus. He was the one that taught them how to pray. He was the one that taught them how to do miracles. He was the one that taught them how to cast out demons. He was the one that allowed Peter to walk on the water. He was the one that fed the 5,000. And all they knew was him. And now you come to tell me that you want us to be patient until a promise comes that's greater than you? And Jesus said, yes. There's a promise coming because since I have descended from heaven and now I have an earthly body, I can only be with you in one place. Let's look at the practicality of the word. I can only be with you in one place, but I'm sending the promise, which is the Holy Spirit, that can be with you all the time, no matter where you at, and he's not limited to one person. He's not limited to one person. So while he's helping your cousin get healed in Africa, he's helping your marriage in America. Oh, God, somebody help me here. So he can be everywhere. So I'm sending you a promise because this is the thing. I don't want you to be comfortless. Notice the word that Jesus used. In the gospel according to St. John, he said, I'm sending you a comforter. And then the Amplified Bible, you know how the Amplified Bible does. It gives you even more words. And we broke down every word in Bible study on Wednesday night. If you missed it, oh, I'm sorry. But we broke down every word in Bible study. It's not taped, so I can't help you. You missed it. But next time I'll see you, praise God. But we broke down every word in Bible study. So he's a comforter. He came that we may be comforted because we, how many know sometimes you need help? You need help. And Jesus said, I can't be there with you. I'm going to sit beside the Father on the right hand. I'm going to help you in the courtroom of heaven when the enemy comes to accuse you and you're probably guilty. But when he comes to accuse you, I'm going to get you out of it because I'm your advocate. I can't be there with you, but I'm not going to leave you comforted. I'm going to send you somebody. He's the third person in the guard here. You don't know him yet, but I'm about to introduce him to you. He's the Holy Spirit, and he's only going to tell you what he heard me and the daddy talking about. He's going to eavesdrop on our conversation when he's talking, when we're talking about you, and then he's going to come and tell you what we said about you, and hopefully it's good. He's only going to tell you what we say so i want you to wait for the comforter the holy spirit but when he comes he's coming to give you power 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 i looked at that word because i was trying to figure out what kind of power is he going to give us have you ever thought about it those who've been in pentecost for a while did these services for a while. Have you ever talked? They always talk about after the Holy Ghost comes, then you're going to have power. What kind of power are you going to have? Power to do what? Power to say what? But everybody gets happy off the power. But what is the power doing? Oh, God. Maybe you ain't never thought about that. Maybe I'm just too deep. I don't know. I, power. So I went to the Amplified Bible, and then the Amplified Bible said not just power, it said ability. Efficiency and might. I said, well, Lord, why don't we go to Webster and find out what does ability mean? Ability means the power or skill to do something. Efficient. 
the ability to do something or produce something without wasting material time or energy. I thought about that. That can't be the church. Efficiency. And then it said might. Might is the strength to do something. So when I look at power, I know we like to shout and run around the church and get happy, but that power ain't talking about that. When I define power, he's talking about I'm going to give you the ability to do something. Well, what is the something? What is the something? I had to go a little further. I had to go more in the book of Acts because I want to find out what the something is. So if you want to find out what the something is, find out what he did when the disciples got filled with power. And Peter, 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 my boy Peter, Peter who cut off the man's head, Peter who denied Christ three times when the power came. And all 11 of them were standing before the people and the other I guess 119, because there was 120 in the upper room, was standing before the people. Peter stood up. Peter, nowhere in the Bible that it declares that Peter has a degree in public speaking. Nowhere in the Bible that it declares that Peter has a PhD in giving speeches. Peter was a fisherman. But when the power came, he stood up before more than 3,000, because 3,000 gave their lives to Christ. Didn't say it was only 3,000, 3,000 gave their life. He stood up to more than 3,000 and declared the word of God. Now, I got to jump a little bit for, further to help you understand, because when Peter went before the Pharisees and Sadducees and he was accused, they said, we know that these are ignorant men, but we recognize that they've been with Jesus. Peter, who didn't have theology school, didn't go to seminary, gave a sermon on the day of Pentecost that convicted 3,000 people, but he couldn't do it until the power came. When the power came, Peter could do something. Well, pastor, I can't do that. How do you know you can't? Peter was a fisherman. May I propose to you that when the power comes, and this is my first point, and I'm going to be out here. When the power comes, it's going to help you do what you do, even if you don't know what you do. I'm going to say it again. It's going to help you do what you do, even when you don't know what you do. Peter didn't know. I feel like preaching. Peter didn't know he could preach. Peter didn't know he could help 3,000 people get saved. All he knew, I can throw it in the bed in there, and I can pull up a fish. I can drop a net, and I can pull up a fish. But when the power comes. What's on the inside begins to rise up on the outside, even if you don't know what's on the inside. When the power comes, Peter was a fighter. He won't no public speaker. When Jesus said, take the sword, Peter was the one that grabbed it. Peter cut off the man's ear. He was a fighter, not a lover. He couldn't talk. But when the power came, he had the ability to declare God's word and could come to say it in such a way that the Bible said it picked the heart. I, I noticed the words of the Bible. Maybe I'm just too picky, but I noticed the words of the Bible. It said it pricked their heart. I mean, he said something that went deep. It went on the inside of Peter, who never had a public speaking class in his life, was out there just talking to fish when the power came. Got 3,000 people saved. And I'm asking the Lord, send the power. Because when the power comes, you'll be able to do what you do, even if you don't know what you do. I'm about way finished. I cannot get to point number two because when the power comes, we always talk about the power, but there's a conjunction in the middle of verse eight. We learned about conjunctions the other week. There's a conjunction in the middle of verse eight. It says, after the Holy Ghost comes, you shall receive power and, hold up, and, 
and means something is coming behind it and means there's more than just power why do we only teach about power when there's an and in the verse we only look at it one side. We only look at one half of the end. We don't look at the other half of the end. He said, and ye shall be witnesses for me. And I know this. I didn't see this when I was at home, but as I was reading the text, I know this. He said, you're going to be witnesses in me in Jerusalem and Judea. Those are church lands. Follow me for a moment. If, if I can contemporize it, those are church, Jerusalem, where he was born, Judea, the son of Judea. He came from the tribe of Judea. Those are church territories. But Samaria is where the Jews weren't supposed to go. Samaria was off limits. Samaria was like us. Oh, how can I get this? <laughs> Samaria is like taking your BMW in the hood. And leaving it there with the door unlocked. <laughs> That's what some man is. And he said, you're going to be witnesses to me in the church and outside the church. When the Holy Ghost comes, we want to talk about the power, but we don't want to talk about the witnessing. Because he declared you're going to do both. May I propose to you that some, oh, I heard you, Holy Ghost. Some of your Samaritan is on your job. Some of your Samaritan is your loved ones. Some of your Samaritan is your friend. You got a Samaritan in your life, and God said, I'll send the power, the Holy Spirit, so you can be a witness. Because Jerusalem and Judea is comfortable, but Samaritan isn't. Samaritan ain't comfortable. They ain't customer testify and witnessing the people who see you every day. Heard you complaining about what the boss said. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Say, heard you get, getting tired about, I'm tired of doing this job. Can I go home? <laughs> it's hard to witness when your hair is down <laughs> and everything is out there and you still got to talk about Jesus. Yeah. Maybe Jesus needs to be in your hair when it's down. <sighs> Then you could talk about him. He said, and. And. There's a second part of the promise that we skip in church. When the last time you heard a Pentecost message talk about witnessing? I ain't going to go there. <laughs> he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send the Holy Ghost. He's going to give you power. He's going to give you power to do what you do, but he's going to give you power to be a witness too. And to be a witness everywhere you go. That's why he sent the Holy Ghost, so he can be with you everywhere you go. You see, when you're in ministry like I am, and you got the collar on your neck, Sister Brendan, you got the collar on your neck, you forget the collar's on your neck. So that's why you got to be careful what you say and where you walk, because you forget the collar. It's on your neck. And if I don't got Jesus and the collar is on my neck, I may not be a good witness. Come on, son. Oh, you can't have a collar on your neck go pick up a filth. All right, oh, well, well. <laughs> you can't be in a collar on your neck and go pick up a pack of cigarettes at 7 Eleven. You can't have a collar. Oh, God. But you don't got no collar, but you still witness. My proposal you got an invisible collar. Jesus, you got an invisible collar. You are a witness for God. When you're on Facebook, your invisible collar is there. They look at your profile. Oh, you go to church. What church you belong to? You always posting about your church, but yet still you're posting things that ain't witnessing to the glory of God. My, my, my. Because everywhere you go, you're a witness. So you're either a good one or a bad one. Because there's no in between. Oh, God. A CEO of a company. Everywhere he goes, he represents the company. Well, I'm off work. You ain't off work. A CEO is 24-7. That's why if he does something unseemly that causes a bad reputation, you don't see him get fired. You see them resign. At least a good CEO, he'll resign. <laughs> if they got to fire you, you ain't going nowhere no more. But he'll resign. I didn't represent the company well, so I'm going to resign. 
Because everywhere he goes, he represents the company he is a CEO of. May I propose to you that God gave you a company and you're the CEO of it and you, your part of it belongs to God. And every time you walk around, you're representing him. You're representing him. He came not only that you may do what you do, but he came that you also may be an effective witness, which means successful. I want to be successful on the good side of witnessing from God, not on the bad side of witnessing from God. So sometimes I got to check myself. I got to make sure. I'm doing what God told me to do. Can I hit point number three? And I'm almost done, y'all. Because if we know that we ought to be a witness, he said, and be witnesses for me. And we know that witnessing is more than just with your words. Witnessing is also how you live. And he told me to be a witness that if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. That means if he wants me to be a witness, that means he's going to help me live. Let me show it to you. If he wants, if he says you're going to be a witness, that means I'm going to have to be a witness in my life. But in my life, I need help. So he didn't just come to give me power to do what I do and be a witness, but he also came, gave me power to live right for him. Because that's the biggest witness you can be, living right for God. So he came also that you can live right. Because sometimes we don't want to do right, and this flesh don't help us. And we need extra power to live right. You know sometimes you want to do some things and the Lord and the Holy Spirit said, no, don't do that. You want to tell them a piece of your mind. I wish I could get real in here. You want to let them know, I know what's going on. You ain't playing me. See, you hate when people play you and they think they're playing you. And you know they, you know they ain't playing you. But you want them to know they ain't. I, can I preach in here for just a few minutes? Uh, you want them to know that they ain't playing you. You more mad about them not knowing that they ain't playing you than you are about them trying to play you. If I could be real in here today. And here the Holy Ghost says, sit down. But, but Lord, I want them to know they ain't playing me. Sit down. I don't care if they know not. You know they ain't playing you, so live holy. Live righteous. Be what I called you to be. It don't matter if they know or not, because when it's all said and done, and my glory comes upon you, everybody going to know you won't play. I felt that one right there. We got to be stop being so much self-righteous and be God-righteous. Oh, God. Self-righteousness wants to validate yourself. God-righteousness wants to validate who God is. And sometimes in order for me to validate who God is, I got to shut up. Let me talk to this side. Sometimes in order to validate who God is, I got to shut up. Because the more I run my mouth, the more I'm validating me. And I ain't validating God. And God ain't getting no glory in me running my mouth about me. So I just got to let them think that they're doing something. But there's a, there's a scripture that encouraged my heart. Everything that's done in the darkness shall come to light. God made me that promise. So I take confidence in that. And I shut my mouth. <laughs> Jesus, I be quiet because the Holy Ghost is trying to help me live. Can I catch this? Can you catch this? He's trying to help me live, not get revenge. He's trying to help me live, not help me get revenge. Trying so much to validate yourself. No, let God validate you. The Bible said, don't even walk up to the head table and then get embarrassed when they tell you there ain't no seat for you. Amen. The Bible said, I'm paraphrasing, eatingizing, contemporizing it, and analyzing it all at the same time. See, you can't walk to the head table. You got to sit at the back and then ask them, oh, you're not, you're not supposed to be sitting right there. Well, I'm, I'm comfortable. No, 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 no. Come up here. This is where you're supposed to be. And then the one that's sitting in your seat, they say, you need to move. That's not your seat. You ever been on an airplane and sat in the wrong seat? 
The stewardess will come and say, oh, excuse me, sir, this is not your seat. This is not your seat. No, no, excuse me, this is not your seat, sir. Can you please move, please? Oh, you didn't buy that. This is not where you're designed. See, you too busy trying to move somebody out of your seat. Sit in the back and let God move them. Let God vindic vindicate you. Let God do it. And when God do it, can't nobody throw shade on God. Oh, God, I got this. Can't nobody throw shade on God. They'll, show, they'll throw shade on you. But when God validates who you are, they'd be like when they try to throw shade on Jesus. Well, well, well he did heal the people. The Bible declares that when all the witnesses came to testify against Jesus the night he was crucified, they just couldn't say nothing bad. Even when they tried to say something bad, all they said was good things. And when God validates you, when they're trying to say bad, the bad is good. <laughs> Allow the Holy Spirit came to help me live right for God. But can I close this on point number four? Can I close this on point number four? The Holy Ghost also came to do something else to help you. Today, I'm, I'm in the, this morning, about 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm, I'm, I'm putting my message together. Well, before 6 o'clock, I didn't hit prayer yet. I'm putting my message together, and the power go out. The power go out, and everything out of type goes out, and the power comes back on. And I turn the computer back on, and it goes to the reset, and ain't nothing up there. I said, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> See, sometimes the program will come back up. But the program didn't come back up. I got a little worried. So I went to the word program to put it up. And I'm looking, and it didn't say nothing. But then it said, go to your last auto say message. <laughs> and I, I clicked it, and it popped up. And the Lord said, sometimes the devil sends a power outage. Oh, I feel like preaching. Sometimes the devil sends a power outage in your life because he's trying to distract what's happening in your life. But God said the Holy Ghost is an auto save and an auto recovery. And all you got to do is get back into the Holy Ghost and he'll give you everything back that you lost when the enemy sent the power failure. I don't care if the power go out because this is what I learned. When the power go out, it just ain't coming to my house, but there's still power. Oh, did you hear me? It's not in your house, but there's still power. When the devil takes power out of my house, the powerhouse is still running. And if the powerhouse is still running, he can recover everything I lost. The Holy Ghost is an auto save. <laughs> He'll save you when you get in trouble. He'll save you when you messed up. He'll save you when you look like you can't make it. He'll save you when the enemy thought, I got you now. I shut everything down. You lost everything. You don't know what to do. And the Holy Ghost said, just pull it back up. But ain't nothing there. Just pull it back up. I can't see nothing. Just pull it back up. Go back. My title didn't even come up. But it said the last thing you were doing. Because sometimes the enemy is trying to kill the last thing you were doing. Sometimes trying to kill the last thing you were doing. Because the last thing you were doing was for the glory of God. The last thing you was doing is for the purpose of God. God was trying to bless you. And the enemy trying to kill the last thing you do. And the enemy said, don't worry about no power outage. When I'm the power source. The Holy Ghost say, I'm the power source. Why are you worry about the power outage? I just got to reconnect you. But when your power go out, that coast still got power. All they're trying to do is reconnect you to the power source. And sometimes you got to chill in the dark. <laughs> oh, Holy Ghost, help me today. <laughs> you got to chill in the dark. See, when you know the power is coming back on, you don't panic. It's just a time for me to relax, I guess. Maybe I was looking at too much TV here. <laughs> Maybe this so far, I don't need to see her. I'm just going to chill in the dark. And when the power comes back on, I'm back where God wants me to be. See, don't panic when the power go out. Just wait till God restores the power. Wait till the Holy Ghost bring you back to where you And the enemy think he got you because the power went out. 
But he don't know. It's just a refreshing time. It's time to get back to the bases. Power go out. All the kids can't look at TV. Come on, let's play a game. We ain't playing no game in a while anyway. Let's do something. How are we going to play a game? Light a candle. Be Pinnick, Pin, Teddy Pendergraph. Light a candle. Oh, I ain't going to help me. Light a candle and do what God called you to do. The enemy wants to take you out. But the Holy Spirit is your auto save. And when he think you done lost everything. And you didn't even back it up yet. The Holy Ghost said, don't worry. <laughs> I got this. It's backed up. And I'll bring you back to where you were. Why? Because that's what he came to do. Can you give God praise right there? <laughs> that's what he came to do. Rest your feet all over the building. I asked the question Wednesday night, if the Holy Ghost is a comforter, why we got so many people feeling like they don't got no help? If he's a helper, why are people feeling helpless? Because they're not accessing the power of the Holy Spirit. As I'm about to close this and pray, can I, can I give you this analogy? The Holy Spirit is like this. You got $5 in your bank. Five dollars in your pocket. Five dollars. And you need something else. But you forgot. You got money in the bank. As long as you just concentrate on what's in your pocket. The power is there. The resources is there. But you just have access. To it. But hold up. I got some. And you go get your card and get the money out. Too many people are limited to what they think they have in their pocket and don't realize God has given them a card to access everything they need and they don't access the power and so they feel helpless they feel alone they feel comfortless when the Holy Spirit is there to comfort you in the midnight hour to be with you when nobody else is there. I want to pray this morning that just like the day of Pentecost because it declares, and let me do this real quick, it declares it in the Bible in this verse that as they were praying the Holy Ghost fell. But if you go further in the book of Acts, it says that Peter and, and John, I believe it was, went to a town and they didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost. He said, well, when, would, when were you baptized? He said, we know nothing about the Holy Ghost. And the Bible said they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And another place where they were just praying again and as they were just assembled together, the Holy Spirit fell. This morning, as I'm praying, I'm asking God to fill your house. I want the Holy Ghost to fill you. If I've already been filled, then I want to refill it. Because I don't want to walk this earth and live for God and don't have access to full power. That's not life. And he came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Father, in the name of Jesus, this Pentecost Sunday as we commemorate what you did so long ago and sending the gift is still here now it's already here I ask you in the name of Jesus as we become open vessels to you this morning that everyone in this house that's not filled that you will fill them now and everyone in this house that just needs a refilling you will refill them now. One baptism, but many refillings. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, as we lift our hands to you now, baptize those that need to be baptized in your spirit right now. In the name of Jesus. And refill those who need a refilling right now. 
in the name of Jesus. And we receive it by faith. We receive salvation by faith. And we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the same way. By faith. And so we open our mouths. And we said, thank you, Lord, for filling me now. Thank you, Lord, for baptizing me now. Thank you, Lord, for doing it for me right now. Thank you, Lord, for doing it now. And I receive it. And it is mine in the name of Jesus. Oh, come on, give God a praise right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You did it again. We're grateful unto you for it, Lord. And we bless your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give him another praise right there.